Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is discover the land of fire and ice, all about Iceland. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Eddie Savage. Eddie, thank you so much for being here today and for taking us away with you to Iceland for the next hour. Let's dive in. Right on, thank you very much, Sunny. It is fantastic to be here. And I have got to say, I'm really, really excited to present on Iceland. Uh, it's hard to believe that it's been, gosh, I, I was last there in September and uh, I'm already heading back. So I'm really, really excited. Um, this presentation, of course, is a no before you go. Um, so I'm going to try to give you as much of the, the, the important details, you know, how to pack, what to expect uh, for the upcoming adventure, and let's get ourselves excited for a trip to Iceland. I'm heading there in nine days. Um, I'm going to do a little pre-season uh, loop of Iceland and exploration, and then uh, I will be joining my first group in about a month today. So that's, that is wonderful. Okay, so let's get started. Um, oh, of course, i got to click the button. There we go. Um, so images on the screen, this is me. Hi, I'm Eddie Savage. I've been with Natural Habitat Adventures since 2016. I started with their polar bear program and uh, advanced to a whole variety of other destinations. Uh, three seasons in Churchill, Northern Lights, Beluga Whales, uh, their wild side of China, uh, Switzerland while we were running the Switzerland trips, um, as well as the Iceland trip. And I'll be heading to Greenland as well uh, this upcoming summer. Um, when I'm not leading uh, natural habitat adventures, I am leading my own personal adventures. And so pictured on the left is uh, my family, my partner, Candice, and our lovely 10 and a half week old baby, Lily. Um, so away we go. Um, today, we are going to, of course, get excited for the upcoming expeditions. I'm going to help you get best prepared. I'm going to give you some of my personal gear recommendations from um, having spent uh, quite a bit of time traveling Iceland and, and seeing exactly what to expect on our trips. And I'm also here to answer your questions. Um, so I want to make sure that uh, that I leave a good a chunk, a good chunk of time at the end of the at the end of the presentation so you can uh, load me up with questions. So uh, away we go. So first off, folks, why Iceland? Well, it is the land of fire and ice. Uh, it has an amazingly rich natural environment, dramatic scenery, and extraordinary people. I think that's a pretty pretty good reason to go anywhere. But Iceland is very special, and something I, I hope you'll pick up in some of the pictures, and you'll definitely see while you're on foot in Iceland, is the, the scenery is different. A lot of it is tundra. It is a very raw and rugged uh, countryside. Iceland itself is very young. Um, Volcanically, some of the oldest rock is kind of in the 14 to 16 million year range, uh, which compared to a lot of North America is is extremely, extremely young. And of course, Iceland is fo formed entirely from uh, volcanic activity. So you have kind of this this really cool contradiction between um, raw, brand new land, like the most recent volcanic eruption was I think, last September. Um, so raw, rugged land. Um, with kind of this tundra landscape, uh, a vibrant people, as well as the ice um, that makes up about 11% of the surface of Iceland, glaciers, ice caps, uh, and that kind of stuff. It is really a, a, a complex system and no two days on the entire trip um, will feel the same. They are like, that's how much this country changes as we uh, continue on our journey. So that's, I think, why we picked Iceland. I'm sure you've seen a lot of photos, videos, heard stories, but nothing really compares to actually being on foot there. And uh, I'm really excited to to join my groups. And I know all the expedition leaders are excited to join you there as well. Um, now I want to take a second to talk about uh, the Icelanders, the Icelandic people. Um, the Icelandic people are incredibly passionate about where they live. They love where they live. They have uh, uh, an extraordinary sense of humor. They're really, really tight-knit communities. Think about it, probably two-thirds of the population of, of Iceland's 375, 400,000 people um, live in Reykjavik, and the rest um, of the population live in small towns, numbering from, you know, 50 to 100 to, you know, 
the second largest city being Akureyri, the capital of the north with around, I think, 20,000 people. Um, so a lot of very small uh, communities, tight-knit communities, and just a really wonderful, connected uh, group of people. Um, and something I noticed is everybody everybody that uh, I've come across, or at least the, the folks that we work with, um, everyone seems to wear a number of hats, whether it be, um, you know, they're working as local guides and, and showing people Iceland's landscape in the summer um, to doing, uh, you know, ice cave tours in the winter um, to a whole variety of things. But everybody's doing so many different things um, uh, in, in a really beautiful, small country. So I'm going to dive right in here and address kind of the, the elephant in the room, which is on a small island or an island uh, that is volcanic, covered in ice, doesn't really have very many trees and sits in the North Atlantic. What are we to expect for the weather? Um, you will experience a lot of weather. And the way that I'd put it is you're probably going to have at least one of these things on any given day um, of your trip, whether it be rain, wind, fog, overcast, a hot sunny day, and maybe even snow. Um, Iceland, you know, the average temperatures, I've got some, some graphs I can show you in a little bit, um, but basically the, uh, you're gonna experience a lot of weather. So I've just got a couple pictures here you know this is a nice kind of rainy foggy day when we went uh one of our groups went up onto the ice you can see how they're dressed everyone's got their rain jackets on some layers uh heavy pants uh, that kind of thing gloves and then you know we can get the nice calm and sunny days like this and then later that day it can look something like this we can have a little bit of a weather system come in where it's a little gloomy a little foggy a little windy a little rainy um but ideally you know, I hope that we all get to have uh, some blue sky days. Um, typically the south of Iceland is a little bit uh, uh, warmer, but also a little wetter. And, and the north of Iceland, like Isafjord, when we go to the West Fjords, um, is a little bit cooler, but uh, a little bit clearer, a little drier. Uh, so here's kind of your typical summer temperatures. I'll just bring these here for Vik, which is in the south of Iceland, and Isafjord, which is up in the West Fjords, kind of uh, completely opposites of uh, of Iceland um, to give you an average range of the temperature and give you an idea of uh, temperatures you should expect. I, I mean, when I when I look at Iceland and when I think about the temperatures I experienced, it's it'd be really nice if the coldest that it got on a July day was 48.9 degrees Fahrenheit in Vic, or if it was 44.4 degrees Fahrenheit, um, uh, or you know, in in Isafjord. The, the reality is, as soon as you add in the, the mixture of, of wind and a little bit of rain, um, it can get a little bit colder. So it's a good idea to be prepared for that in the sense of, of what clothes to wear and that kind of thing. I wouldn't say that it, it got very close to freezing, but it definitely, um, on a few occasions uh, throughout, I did five, five trips last year. Uh, in Iceland spanning the whole summer. On a few occasions, it did drop below 40 degrees. So just an idea, you know, we're still gonna go if it's raining or if it's if it's windy, we're still gonna be doing our activity. So it's a good idea to be prepared for that uh, when we go. And here's an idea of kind of how wet it's gonna be, how much rain they get. Um, so again, south of Iceland gets quite a bit more rain. It's the, the wettest part. I call it kind of like a moss rainforest, um, but uh, it gets lots and lots of rain. Uh, throughout the summer, um, I think about 10 days, uh, 10 days a month um, is kind of what it looks like. But that doesn't mean it's going to rain all day. Um, there's a lot of systems that move through because we are an island sitting in the North Atlantic. There's a lot of systems that move through. So just because the day starts raining doesn't doesn't mean it's going to stay raining all day. Uh, it's probably going to clear up somewhere along the way. And because we're always traveling, we're changing weather systems and we're traveling through kind of very mountainous regions that can generate their own. Uh, kind of weather systems, that is uh, a big a big factor as well. So you could start in the morning and it could be raining. You could end in the afternoon. It could be gloriously sunny. Um, and I think that that is true for a lot of places in the world, but uh, weather really uh, changes quickly. The old saying that I've heard in a lot of coastal places, because we're surrounded by ocean on, in Iceland, is, you know, if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes. It really, really holds true. Um, 
So here is an image from one of my expeditions last year where we were going out onto this glacial lagoon in a Zodiac. Um, and we started, it was like perfectly calm. There might've been a little bit of a breeze. It was perfectly calm. We were heading towards the ice and you can see the equipment that they get us set up in these big kind of Mustang, um, kind of life jackets, waterproof, uh, wind resistant life jackets, rain pants and boots. So they, they give us this equipment when we do that experience and they'll do the same for kind of the Zodiac rides and that kind of stuff. They'll give us the heavier equipment. Um, but having layers underneath is really important. So anyways, back to my story, we were heading out. It was really, really calm um, there. And, and given that uh, right above us here on the ice, it's basically up onto the, the uh, Vatniokul um, ice cap. Um, we had wind basically just stream down off the ice onto the water. And in five minutes, it went from glassy calm to the sea state that you can see here. And we had to turn around and basically get off on a, get off on a beach because uh, it, was, it was too rough to be out in the boats and there was too much water moving around. So um, that's where our favorite friend, the wind blows in. And uh, wind is a big factor in Iceland. It is a windy place. Um, and again, it's not one of those things that's gonna stick around for the entire day. Um, but we can definitely have some wind. So, you know, if it's not for protecting against the rain, I'll talk about gear in a little bit. If it's not for protecting against the rain, it'll be for protecting yourself against the wind. Um, and that's a really good reason to have a great rain jacket with you. Great rain jacket, great rain pants to cut that wind and keep you warm while we're out on our adventures. Uh, trail and hiking considerations. So just a, a description of some of our walks. Uh, we've got volcanic rock trails. We have some wet trails. There's going to be some dry trails. There'll be some uh, round rock walking, um, smooth boulders. This this photo I just uh, clicked to here is uh, walking um, through the Aske Caldera um, towards uh, the, the lake that's there. Um, we also may have some jagged rock walking where it's, you know, a little bit rougher a little bit more raw um, and so you're kind of you want to have good tread on your shoes and, and good sturdy footwear with ankle support uh, for walking along uh, some of these rocky trails um, and then we're also going to have lots of places where we just hop out for you know five or ten minutes and and have a look around and enjoy the scenery and oftentimes the walking is pretty smooth but sometimes you know if you want to go a little bit further afield away from the road then you're going to want to have Again, something that's pretty sturdy. And I hope something that you've noticed about uh, the folks in these pictures is their boots are all hiking boots um, and not necessarily hiking shoes. So hiking boots are definitely the way to go um, for, for the best ankle support and the most comfort while you're out on this trip. Um, yeah, so, and, and one thing I, I do wanna emphasize is uh, my last point on this, um, uh, trail and hike consideration slide is the potential to experience water. Whether it's walking through a muddy trail, whether it is falling from the sky, whether it is being blown sideways because of some wind, uh, there's a very good chance that we're going to experience water uh, during the trip, or it could be the mist coming off of a big waterfall. Um, and so having a nice set of, uh, like making sure your boots are waterproof and test them before you come is is really important. Make sure you know, that you're happy that they're, they're waterproof enough. They're, they're not just soaking in the water and your feet are wet after five minutes of walking uh, on a rainy day. Make sure you've got some nice uh, waterproof footwear um, because we will experience water. Um, so clothing, my, this is, this is basically kind of my, my list now. And um, I just want to emphasize for a lot of my recommendations, there's a really amazing list that has been compiled and put together by uh, expedition leaders um, in the pre-departure briefing. It's, it's so good. I actually, when I'm like, okay, how, do I, how should I pack for Iceland? I go back to the pre-departure briefing and I'm just like, okay, oh yeah, I need this and this and this because, um, you know, much like many of you kind of global travelers, you travel all over the world and um, it's sometimes tricky to remember exactly what you need for a specific departure. And so head to that pre-departure briefing. And yeah, I actually, I was just kind of getting ready for my Iceland trip and I actually screenshot 
um, the list on my phone so I can just refer to it to make sure I've got everything um, that is recommended. So it's compiled by expedition leaders and it's such a great list uh, to hold on to. So I'm gonna give you my recommendation, what works for me. And then if you wanna refer back to something, the best place to find it is definitely gonna be in the pre-departure briefing under what to pack. Um, so sturdy footwear, like I was saying, the hiking boots, waterproof with ankle support is really good. And then I also will bring walking shoes. So we don't wanna be wearing our hiking boots, you know, to dinner and around the hotel um, or to breakfast and stuff like that. Or, you know, there's, you don't need to wear your hiking boots 24 seven. Um, we will have lots of opportunities where maybe we're just doing, um, you know, a, a nice gentle walk where it's pretty much guaranteed or the day, the day is more of a, a kind of groomed path and it's guaranteed that, you know, it's not gonna rain or we're not gonna get wet. And yeah, having your walking shoes throughout the day uh, might be really nice for you um, so that you're not you know, always in your hiking boots. And then of course in the evenings um, um, or on days where we have you know, a lot of time on the bus, it might be more comfortable for you to be sitting in your, in your walking shoes. Um, I, I bring kind of like lightweight trail shoes. Um, that's what I prefer, but you know, running shoes or trainers will be fine as a secondary pair of shoes to your hiking boots. Um, waterproof rain gear. I hope I hope my discussion of like water and you know wind and rain kind of encouraged you to get a good set of waterproof rain gear or to bring a good set of waterproof rain gear. Um, definitely test it. Um, if you have an older set of rain gear that, that you know you're just like, oh yeah, I got this you know 10 years ago and it's been sitting in the closet for that one trip you did. Um, back in the day, make sure you test that gear because a lot of waterproof liners and, and, uh, and uh, weather seal can actually, um, or seam, seam, yeah, seam seal um, can actually deteriorate over time. And so just make sure that, you know, you either go outside on a rainy day or, or you know, ask someone to spray you with the garden hose or something. Um, just test out your, your rain gear. Make sure that it's not like leaking a lot. Make sure it is working. Um, before you bring it, we've had some. I've had some some folks that were pretty unhappy on their trip because uh, the the waterproof liner was kind of peeling out of their rain jacket. They thought it was good, and they brought it, and it was it it didn't it didn't end up helping them very much at all. So double check that. And then again, my clothing uh, packing must-haves is layers. So um, both for my feet, my legs, my torso. Um, I like to have layers and options um, when I'm there. So I'm going to show you my my daily Iceland adventure attire on the next slide. But layers, 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 uh, really important to have a good set of layers, not rely on one article of clothing to keep you warm all day. You're going to want to have several layers so you can change because the days, like I described, you start and it's cool, it ends up being hot or it could start warm in the morning and end up being cool in the evening. Um, we often don't have access to our check bags because they're they're tucked away deep into the the depths of the um, the the bus that we're traveling with, or they're back at the hotel if we're staying somewhere for a couple nights. So it's always good to kind of have layers with you and and wear them on you. A uh, warm hat, a toque, or ski cap, and a neck gaiter are also really important. So I bring a ball cap, I bring a ski cap, um, and I bring a neck gaiter um, and gloves, of course. So this is this is basically what I wear um, on any given day. It's it is a solid kit that keeps me nice and warm, or it keeps me nice and cool. So I have a, a mid-weight merino wool base layer. Um, I have several of them that I exchange throughout the trip. I bring a fleece vest, and then I have a down puffy jacket that goes over top. So base layer, fleece vest, down puffy jacket, and then I have my rain jacket. If it's raining, I'll wear it. If it's not, or if it's windy, I'll throw it on and it just cuts the wind and it helps kind of keep that heat um, inside. Um, I also wear a ball cap and I have a warm hat and I'll bring a neck gaiter and gloves. So that's on the top layers. On the bottom layer, I've got a good pair of uh, hiking wool socks. Um, I really like smart wool. Um, that's probably one of my favorites, not to plug any uh, specific brand, but there's lots of really good kind of uh, hiking wool socks out there. Uh, make sure make sure they're they're you know not too too thick. You kind of want like again kind of a mid weight wool sock uh, for walking. Um, I am either wearing my walking shoes or hiking boots depending on what we're doing for the day. Um, and your expedition leader can always advise you if you're like okay you know we're going to start the day 
walking and then later tonight or later this afternoon there's going to be you know a two mile hike so make sure you've got your hiking boots accessible um, that's something that your expedition leader can advise day to day but basically depending on what the plan is what you've been told by your expedition leader um, walking shoes or hiking boots and then sturdy hiking pants so i've got you know if you're if you're someone who likes kind of the thinner quick dry um, pants you might want to have a base layer underneath um, it depends how how cool you get and your your personal uh, operating temperature but a sturdy pair of hiking pants is good so i kind of have like uh, i don't even know they're they're kind of a, a heavier material um, so i don't i don't wear a base layer underneath i just have kind of like a heavier uh, hiking pant and then I'll bring my rain pants in my backpack as well. So if it's raining, I'll put them on. If not, they're always with me um, just in case it starts raining or it gets windy as we've discussed. Um, and then in my backpack, um, aside from my camera, binoculars and all that kind of stuff, I've always got layers that I'm not, uh, that I'm not wearing, the layers I've taken off, layers I could add. Um, and then I've got uh, a pair of collapsible hiking poles, um, which is nice in particular, if you walk with hiking poles or you go on hikes with hiking poles, uh, Iceland is a great place to have a set of those. So if you have a good pair of travel collapsible hiking poles, um, that's fantastic. I know there's I know there's some that can collapse pretty well, and I found that they're they're really handy in particular when we're doing uneven walks. And a lot of trails are pretty uneven, um, like not not horrendously uneven, but it is kind of volcanic rock, and there's lots of little ups and down steps, um, kind of loose loose debris, um, that kind of stuff. So it's it's always a good idea to have those. And we'll have a few backup pairs um, with us on the bus but uh, if you've got a pair you like be sure to bring them along and then of course water sunscreen and sunglasses um, even if even if it's a, an overcast day if we're anywhere near water or uh, snow it's always a good idea to have sunscreen and sunglasses for that um, and again like i said there's an incredible um, there's an incredible list put together by expedition leaders in the pre-departure briefing that's got all of this stuff. Um, now, I know I already mentioned collapsible hiking poles and sunglasses, hats, and, and sunscreen, that kind of stuff. But uh, having a, a good day pack with a waterproof pack cover will be really helpful. Um, you know, if we do this picture down below is is from the Askia uh, caldera on on kind of a, a one in a hundred type of day, but um, the Askia caldera, basically that walk, you know, four miles, if it's raining or something like that, you want to have a waterproof cap pack cover um, to cover your bag so it doesn't get uh, soaked. Um, same if we're out on the water on a Zodiac um, or something like that. If a wave splashes or there's a little bit of spray coming in the boat, having a waterproof pack cover is really good. There's also lots of day packs that are waterproof in general. Um, but if you don't have that, make sure you've got a pack cover to protect your backpack from the elements because you don't it doesn't do you any good to have your camera inside of a waterproof or a non-waterproof bag and, and have it get soaked. Um, now, photographers. So I know that uh, there's probably some folks doing the Iceland full circle photography tour. There's also some folks who are joining me for the Iceland uh, photo pro um, trip. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea of the, the things that I'm going to be bringing with me on this expedition. So of course, um, there's a full list in the pre-departure briefing. I'm always going to refer you back there because it is so good. Um, so I'm going to have my camera lens kit. So my lenses, my workhorse, my favorite lens that I use in Iceland is the, my 24 to 70. Uh, it's nice and versatile. A lot of landscape is quite big. So I like having the uh, quite big and far away. Um, it's just kind of a, a very vast and open space. So having the ability to get a little bit closer um, with uh, 24 to 70 has been quite nice. Um, I also bring a telephoto lens. Um, I recommend kind of up to, you know, or around 300, like a 70 to 300 or or something like that is gonna be really helpful for wildlife and birds. Um, I've also, you know, an 80 to 400, a 150 to 600, whatever, whatever kind of telephoto lens that you've got that gets you to about 300 millimeters. Um, focal length is gonna be good for a lot of the birds and, Again, if we're getting into, uh, you know, if we're getting into some of the landscape stuff, uh, there is some really cool things you can do with a telephoto lens for landscape. Um, you can kind of zoom in on objects and make them come closer and kind of compress 
uh, objects in the distance so that they look closer and bigger. Um, anyways, we can get into that on a photo trip, but it's really nice to have that type of equipment. Um, and then, of course, just hanging out in your bag, it's not a bad idea to have the 12 to 24 millimeter um, or something like that, uh, you know, down to 12 or 18 millimeter or, you know, I'd even be happy like uh, with just my 24 to 70 for most of the stuff. You can always bring a wider wider lens if you so choose but uh yeah a lot of a lot of stuff i was fine with on my 24 to 70 but i don't want to deter you from bringing it if you're like oh i only want to bring two lenses i do 24 to 70 and a telephoto um and then my third lens which i'm also bringing just so you know is my 12 to 24 millimeter um and then a circular polarizer really good so helping with reflections um and increasing vibrancy um, you can you can use that in particular on kind of cloudy sunny days get a little more contrast into your image um, it also helps to kind of step down uh, your shutter speed um, so you can potentially get some nice kind of those blurred waterfall shots um, sometimes it is so bright and there's so much kind of white um, that it it helps to have a neutral density filter um, so the circular polarizer is, is pretty much a must um for for kind of the serious kind of waterfall landscape photography um but then if you want to have an additional bring a neutral density filter too so i am definitely bringing a circular polarizer and a neutral density filter on this on this trip um a lightweight tripod the tripod in this image here is perfect i think this one you know condenses down to probably about 16 or 18 inches long somewhere in that so it fits into most uh most suitcases, but it's nice and lightweight. Um, I have uh, a, a Manfrotto carbon fiber tripod that I'm bringing, um, just something nice and lightweight. If you're comfortable with carrying, you know, your your larger tripod, that's fine. Just keep an eye on your weights uh, for some of the, the flights that we're going to end up doing later in the trip or towards the end of the trip. Um, always bringing lens cleaning equipment. So I've got a little spray bottle with some lens cleaner and some uh, lens cloths um, that I've always got with me. I also bring a microfiber towel um, as well. So just a little, you know, maybe two foot by one foot, something like that. I don't know what the dimensions are exactly, but it's just a little microfiber towel. So if I'm out taking pictures and I get quite a lot of water um, on my on my camera, then I have something I can dry it off with really quickly before I put it back in my bag. Um, so microfiber towels are always helpful. And then of course, um, it's not on this list, but you can also bring um, kind of like a, uh, a cover for your camera. So if it is looking like it's gonna be a drizzly day and we're doing some uh, photography outside or you're doing some photog photography outside with your group, um, having a, a nice protective cover, whether that's just like a lightweight kind of um, attach via elastic um, uh, cover for your um, uh, camera that would work too or there's some really nice custom made ones that kind of uh, fit directly around your lens and equipment that uh, um, uh, I think there's one by Peak Designs that's pretty good um, so again I think there's actually the lit the, the name of uh, one directly in your pre-departure briefing for a uh, camera cover so that's what I bring um, I don't bring a whole lot else other other stuff that I bring has to do more with being able to transfer photos to lots of memory cards um, and I have a laptop so I can back up my uh, back up my shots every day as well. Um, anyhow, so let's get to the arriving in Iceland. So uh, the international airport in Iceland is the Keflavik International Airport. It is uh, approximately one hour away from Reykjavik, where our, our group hotel is. Um, and so something to keep in mind is once you arrive at the Keflavik International Airport, um, you're going to have to go through Iceland, Iceland immigration. Um, they may search your baggage, do all that kind of stuff. It's essentially the same as going into immigration in, in most countries around the world. They'll give you kind of a, a stamp saying, welcome to the country, kind of the, the tourist uh, visa. And then away you go. There, it's, it's very straightforward. They go, they ask you a few questions. It's always a good idea to have your travel um, itinerary with you. Um, and I believe that information is also in the pre-departure briefing. Um, basically, have your travel itinerary with you. So if they're wondering what you're doing, you've always you know say, here, this is the trip I'm joining. 
Um, if you have arrived in Iceland and you are going to the group hotel um, right away and you don't have your own prior arrangements, uh, NatHab is going to have a shuttle waiting for you. So once you get through the baggage claim, look for an individual holding the Natural Habitat Adventure sign. Um, they will be expecting you and they will transfer you from the Keflavik International Airport a little over an hour uh, into Reykjavik to our hotel. Um, check in. So a lot of flights, they're kind of the red eye flights where, you know, you leave later in the afternoon or the evening uh, from North America and you fly overnight and you arrive early in the morning. So unless you have uh, previous arrangements with the hotel uh, or you've booked an extra night or something like that um, on your arrival day, uh, typically check-in is after 3 p.m. Uh, or check-in is after 3 p.m. But the hotel can store your luggage for you. So if you get dropped off at the hotel, just say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm meant to check in and they won't be able to get you into your room unless you've previously arranged something with them um, and the hotel will store uh, your luggage for you there for the day. Um, and then, of course, there's going to be a welcome letter um, at the hotel check-in from your expedition leader. And that will detail um, essentially welcome dinner, meeting points and times uh, for day one of your trip as well as give you an idea of what's happening on day two of the trip. Um, so keep an eye out for that. But that's arriving um, in Iceland. Um, more arrival information when it comes to money. So one US dollar equals about 136 Icelandic krona. Um, in Canadian dollars, it's really easy. One US dollar or yeah, one Canadian dollar equals about 100 Icelandic krona. Anyways, um, ATMs are easily available um, throughout, well, they're accessible in larger cities, but once we kind of uh, move past some of the larger cities, which happens after about day two, um, we are gonna be few and far between when it comes to ATM. So it's always best if you either uh, either bring um, Icelandic, if you want to bring Icelandic money or US dollars with you um, to, to bring it with you on the flight, um, or you can exchange money at the airport, or you can access an ATM at the airport, or if you have time, um, in Reykjavik, that's probably the very best place to either withdraw cash or, or, um, or exchange money is going to be in the big cities. Um, it's very hard to do it. And we're also on a time schedule when we're uh, out in the field. So best to do it in Reykjavik or, or kind of in the airports or before you come. Um, yeah. And then otherwise, if you're, you know, if you're looking for some, you know, the, Icelandic memorabilia um, to bring back with you from uh, from Iceland, then you can uh, you can use credit cards for most of that kind of stuff too. Um, and this these two slides basically included in the cost of your adventure. I took these directly from the pre-departure briefing. Um, the stuff or basically things included in the cost of your adventure: accommodations, internal airfare, um, airport transfers uh, on day one, and then uh, basically, if you're staying at the group hotel, it's it's all sorted. And then all meals from dinner on day one through breakfast on the final day. And then uh, the, your, the services of the expedition leaders and local guides. Most gratuities, um, there's a few exceptions to the gratuities. And then all activities, flight seeing, interest fees, taxes, permits, and service fees, etc. So pretty much everything's included um, in the trip, except for this fun list here. Um, this is what is not included in the cost of your adventures. So to and from the start of your trip, you know, getting to getting to uh, Keflavik International Airport, um, alcoholic beverages um, are not included. Uh, we may include a drink at the welcome dinner, but uh, otherwise alcoholic beverages are on you if you'd like that. Um, passport and visa fees, if there are any, don't think we're going to have those fees in Iceland. Um, optional activities that you choose to take on outside of the tour. Um, we don't really have a lot of time for optional activities outside of the tour, but uh, if there are any, that's, that's kind of that. Um, items of a personal nature, of course, uh, any airline baggage fees, the required uh, insurances, um, optional travel protection insurance, etc. This is straight from the pre-departure briefing, of course, and then gratuities for your expedition leader and gratuities for your local guides. Um, those are not included in the cost of your adventure. So uh, the local guides, we're going to have two different local guides. We're going to have a local guide that will be our, our driver and local guide for um, 
for most trips about day one until seven. And then on the photo pro trips, there'll be a local guide uh, with us from day one until 11. And then we'll have a second local guide uh, for the Iceland uh, full circle and the Iceland full circle photography will be a second local guide uh, for eight, nine, 10, uh, days eight, nine, and 10. And then uh, for the pro photo or the photo pro, sorry, um, it will be uh, another guide for days 12, 13, 14. So two local guides and one expedition leader to keep in mind there. All right, now let's talk about the adventure. Um, well, folks, Iceland is pretty incredible. The way we're traveling, we've got some excellent buses. Uh, I believe most of them are Mercedes. Uh, they're, they're basically fit for uh, 18 or 19 passengers. They've got a luggage compartment in the back. Um, just as a little note, when you're on board, uh, their seat belts are required. So our group sizes make it so that, that everyone should um, get a window seat. Um, there's room for backpacks on board, so not every seat is full, of course. There's, there's extra space in there for backpacks, and uh, we usually bring some snacks with us as well. Um, there's uh, potentially some USB charging. Uh, we've got climate control, AC, heat, all that kind of stuff, and they've all got big windows um, and extraordinary drivers. Pictured here is Boga, um, and uh, I, last year I had the opportunity to work with Solvig, Boga, and Ragna, and they're all extraordinarily fantastic humans. Um, with just so much uh, personal information uh, to share about Iceland. And there's there's some really, really cool and interesting people that uh, I think you're you're going to adore um, on your traveling. I, I, I can't wait to catch up with them when I get to see them again when I go to Iceland. Um, special excursions. So outside of bus travel, um, we will also be traveling via Super Jeeps, uh, which are um, these large... Uh, Basically, the ones I think they're two Ford excursions, uh, or yeah, a Ford excursion in the back, and then a Ford F three fifty in the front, or something like that. And they're they're cut in half and and welded together uh, in Iceland. Um, they've got you know these big um, big big tires that they can deflate to cruise easily over the highlands of Iceland. Um, so we'll have super jeeps on one day. We're also going to have some really great four by four vehicles um, out in the West Fjords, and we'll have Zodiacs on a couple of Occasions throughout the trip. Um, on the Iceland Pro Photo, we have Super Jeeps, 4x4 vehicles, Zodiacs. We're also going to be uh, utilizing a helicopter as well as some small planes for uh, some of our photography needs. Um, domestic flights. So, in internal flights in Iceland, we will be going from Akureyri over to Isifjordr. Uh, that will be about a 45 minute flight in a smaller plane. Um, the planes that we took last year, one of them was 11 seats, the other one was 19 seats. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, there's room for us, luggage in the back, it's all in the same compartment. Um, it is definitely just a, a people transporter, a people and bags transporter, uh, not as much as uh, one of the larger aircraft. And then Isafjord or to Reykjavik, that's more of a typical um, kind of uh, major city uh, airline, much bigger overhead compartments and that kind of stuff. But it's these flights where the weight uh, limits for baggage come in, um, in particular. Um, we we really, in particular, on the Akureyri to Isafjordr flight, we really don't want to go over our um, allotted uh, 50, 50 pounds for a checked bag and 13 pounds for carry-on bags. So uh, keep in mind, um, really look at the gear that you're bringing and make sure that you've, you've, you're kind of uh, being careful with how much stuff uh, you put into that bag. Don't bring any rocks with you. Accommodations. So uh, where will we stay? One of the things I like to say is, you know, Ice, Icelandic folk, they have really great hospitality. Um, we choose places, not accommodations. So we're not traveling to find the best hotels in Iceland. Um, although I think we pretty much end up in a lot of the, the really, really, really good hotels that are there. And um, I've got this picture of, uh, you know, sod houses, um, just as a joke. We're not going to stay in, in an old, like a, a 1950s built sod house uh, for accommodation, although it would be a cool experience for me. Um, we have some really nice, well taken care of uh, accommodations. 
we select the, the locations for either the views or kind of where they are on our path of expedition. So we're not going to be like, oh no, we have to drive an extra two hours tonight so we can get to a major city to get to a major hotel. Um, we're going to go to what makes sense for us for the maximum adventure, um, the maximum experience uh, for our groups. And with that, we, we've selected, I mean, last year we selected some really fantastic places. I, I think we have a couple changes this year, but they are, um, yeah, beautiful views. It's hard, it's hard to have a bad view in Iceland um, is what I say. Anyways, um, the rooms are pretty typical uh, of European hospitality. So a double bed is two singles pushed together with, you know, one kind of mattress cover on both. A twin is two singles apart, so two single beds. And then a single room is usually a single bed uh, or two single beds in a room, and only one of the single beds has uh, bedding on it. Um, so that's that's typically how it is. They are they are comfy, they're fine, the duvets are warm, the pillows are comfortable. Um, the bathrooms are small by North American standards. Usually they don't have um, bathtubs. Um, they are going to be kind of the stand-up showers, good hot water. Some of the hot water is from geothermal heat as well, uh, which is pretty cool. And then, um, yeah, just remarkable locations. Uh, the mountain in this picture is uh, Herdebred, the Queen of Iceland. And uh, somewhere around the middle of our trip will be in uh, Modradalur. Uh, and if it's clear, we may get a view of that, uh, that beautiful mountain. Uh, food and dietary. So when it comes to local cuisine, um, there is a lot of fish and a lot of lamb. So one of the dominant industries in Iceland being an island situated in the North Atlantic is, the, is fishing. There's a lot of fresh fish. Uh, we will have an opportunity to try fish in many different ways. Um, one of the forms may be in this image, we've got traditional uh, Icelandic, uh, I think this one is a, is a fish soup. Um, there's also gonna be lamb soups. Um, there's going to be lamb and fish prepared in every way manageable, uh, imagine, imaginable throughout the trip. Um, but we also try to incorporate, uh, or we do incorporate kind of people's dietary needs. Um, so we've got, uh, we always have a vegetarian or alternate option um, to move away from fish and lamb, but we need to know in advance. And so when you're looking at your dietary form that you filled out with us, um, we are, we're going to places that, you know, if like, if we go out to, to have lunch on, on a bigger island or in this location here, um, which is in the West Fjords, you know, we're, we're basically letting these folks know what we need for lunch, like a week in advance. And so we need to know what your dietary is before you come on the trip so we can let them know so they can get the supplies to the extremely remote location so that they can prepare it. So if you've got dietary considerations, make sure you update that with us so we, we know what to expect. Um, if you have any concerns, you're just like, you know, I, I eat pretty much everything. Um, it's usually not a big deal. Um, you can always just touch base with your expedition leader when you get to uh, Reykjavik and just let them know uh, kind of what's going on and we can we can help to make some, some changes. But we're also, the expedition leaders are also going and um, kind of preparing some travel um, supplies and snacks and stuff like that ahead of time. So, um, if we, we we basically spend, you know, half a day before you get to Reykjavik uh, sorting out kind of what to bring with us on the bus for our travel, um, travel time and that kind of stuff. And so we want to make sure we've got the right stuff that makes sense. So if you can just fill that information out um, in the best possible way before the trip, that would be great. Um, hotels, usually diverse buffet breakfast options, but I did not have a problem uh, being well fed in Iceland. Um, it is they 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 do pretty pretty nice things with food um yeah and then of course some of our experiences it, it'll make more sense for us to take a picnic lunch with us than to go and find a restaurant so uh, we'll have a few picnic lunches which uh, we will be uh, your expedition leader will talk with you about when we're in iceland typical day first week of the trip lots of short scenic stops uh longer activity stops um uh, for a variety of things you know whether that's uh, going and going for a, a hike um, uh, for an hour or to a waterfall, or if we are going to make a stop at a scenic viewpoint for 20 minutes or something like that. But basically, we have a lot of different stops and a lot of different activities planned throughout the way. Um, but basically, it, it involves driving a bit every day, 
um, usually a, a couple hours, two, two to four hours of driving per day to make our way through Iceland and then lots of stops along the way for experiences and, uh, and exploring and, and immersing ourselves in, the, in Iceland. Um, once we get to the West Fjords, we have three full day excursions where we're going to be having lunches in the field. Um, in the West Fjords, we're going to have Zodiacs, we're going to have uh, four by four vehicles, and we're going to have a small boat um, to take us out there. So that's kind of your typical day. It's, we wake up, we have breakfast pretty early in the morning. Um, we, if we're checking out of the hotel, we bring all our bags out, we load up into the bus, we drive a little bit, we have an activity, we drive a bit, have an activity, drive a bit, have an activity. Um, that's kind of the flow of the trip. So we're always kind of on the move, um, making distance and exploring the beautiful country that is Iceland. Um, the longest hike on the trip is going to be the Askia Caldera hike, um, provided that uh, it's clear and there's not there's not deep snow or or uh, soggy snow that you'll you know go knee deep in um, in the caldera, and that's about four miles. That's the total length to the um, to the end of the trail and back. Um, but we'll be doing lots of short walks. Pretty much every day, um, there there will be a walk of some sort and. Uh, Pictured, you can see that there's a, a bit of a steep trail. This is for um, the uh, basically when we go on the, uh, the the glacier walk. So this is where um, the th this is the steepest part. You basically have to zigzag up. The steepest part of the whole trip, you have to zigzag up kind of this terminal moraine uh, up to where the the glacier is before you go onto the ice um, with your ice pick and crampons. Um, but again, this is something that's optional. Everything is optional. I want to um, make that clear. Um, we always have um, the expedition leader and a local guide, as well as um, some other folks uh, local that are working with us. We just need to uh, know kind of what you're what you're okay with doing, um, and we can try to arrange for uh, either you you hang out closer to the bus, um, catch a few moments of quiet time, or maybe we can arrange a shorter, uh, easier walk nearby. You've just got to talk to your expedition leader and let us know kind of where you're at with different activities. And your expedition leader is always going to be really clear with kind of the, the physical level of each hike. So you don't get in too, too deep over your head. But very manageable, um, lots of communication, and uh, we'll have a nice time. And then just a gear reminder, uh, sturdy, waterproof hiking boots, good rain gear, wool hiking socks. And if you've got them, collapsible hiking poles for those activities and hikes. Now, when it comes to the nature and wildlife folk, uh, everyone, I'm just gonna kinda click through a few pictures here, get us excited. Um, we're gonna spend time in you know, vast expanses of lava fields, looking at volcanoes. This is a table mountain formed under an ice sheet. Again, it's Herdebrid, the queen of Iceland. Um, we're going to be in the East Fjords where you've got very old uh, or older volcanic uh, formations with eroded uh, layers of basalt. Um, we're going to be getting up close and personal with some of the textures and formations of the lava. Um, and we're going to see the new life kind of growing out of the very rugged, um, rugged volcanic soil and terrain as well. This is Moss Campion. We're going to be up close and personal with ice, where we have the ice sheets that sit on top of Iceland spilling out to the lagoons close to the south of Iceland. Uh, we may stop at Diamond Beach, and diamonds aren't always on the beach, but if they are, that's great. Um, we can we can stop and photograph uh, chunks of ice that have come from the ice sheets and floated out into the ocean, and then we're then again washed back up onto volcanic sand beaches. Um, we are going to observe the glaciers from afar and just look at the, the dramatic ice falls and flows and everything, and I love this picture because it kind of looks like a heart, um, the gap in the the glacier there and we're going to explore glacial lagoons and just see uh, ice in all its different shapes sizes forms and colors uh, we've also got an amazing assortment of migratory birds in particular uh, through july and and august we're going to probably see uh, our arctic terns uh, atlantic puffins uh, atlantic puffins fishing for sand eels uh, potentially see some common eiders. We'll also have some humpback whales in the west fjords. Uh, potentially anytime we're near the ocean we could see harbor seals or gray seals. 
Um, and then, yeah, our day when we go whale watching in the West Fjords, if, if we can find some humpbacks, it's some of the, the coolest scenery and the coolest backdrop for, uh, for photographing whales that I've, that I've experienced. Um, anyhow, folks, in conclusion, um, Iceland is a spectacular place to explore. Um, it, is, it is just, like I was saying, every day is so extremely different. Um, Natural Habitat Adventures has done a fantastic job dialing in and honing this experience so we can get the most um, out of our, our time there. And I'm really, really excited to head back. Um, yeah, I'm kind of getting goosebumps thinking about it because I'll be there in 10 days from now. Um, and uh, it, is just, it is just a fun and adventurous place to explore um, with, a, with a great group of people. And thank you very much. Let me know if you have any questions. Eddie, thank you so much. I'm getting goosebumps for you and a healthy dose of envy. Um, so it just looks like an incredible trip. So thank you so much for clarifying um, what to expect and how to prepare. Um, we have a bunch of questions I want to run through as quick as possible. Um, a few folks are curious about insects. Can you quickly summarize the insect threat and how to how to deal with it <laughs> best? I like I like that the insect threat. Um, so <laughs> uh, for the most part, um, we won't really be experiencing insects um, for for most of the trip. There's only a few places um, where we do get a lot of them and for the most part uh, the midges or kind of like black flies little little insects they're not they're not even biting um, they don't bite they just land on your face or they kind of get in your face and that's a little bit frustrating or if it's a windy day they'll hide behind you um, uh, sometimes when we deal with that is when we're in lake mivat so um, that's in the north of iceland towards uh, i think gosh that, that's day i think it's day six or seven of the trip um, we'll be in Lake Mivat when we walk around uh, Lake Mivat and the pseudo craters there, as well as when we go horseback riding. But we have head nets um, that we carry with us, bug nets for your face. So you can throw those on over your helmet for horseback riding. Um, and you can you can uh, wear that on our walks and stuff like that. But usually there's a little bit of a breeze that keeps them away. But if it's a very calm uh, day, we might have a few, of the, few more of them kind of swinging around. But they're not, they're not typically biting, but Lake Mivat in Icelandic is basically Midge Lake. Um, and there's an extraordinarily high number of uh, migratory birds that nest there. And the, the fish is quite, or the, uh, the lake is quite biodiverse in that sense. And it's because of, uh, of a lot of these midges that are in that region and the, the temperatures and climate there. It's cool. Mm. Um, there's also a cluster of questions about um, auroras. Can you um, share with us what the likelihood is of seeing auroras? And then a specific question about where do you think is best to see aurora, Churchill or Iceland and why? Oh, that's, that's tricky. So Iceland in the summer is a poor time for aurora borealis. Um, in the north of Iceland in particular, I think uh, in July, we're looking at like 20 hours, uh, the sun is above the horizon. Um, it doesn't really get dark. And so when we are going to bed at night, one of the bits of advice I'll always give my travelers, um, and I know a lot of the other expedition leaders do too, is when you get to your hotel room, close the blackout curtains um, to start to trigger kind of your, your melatonin or something like that. But basically let your body know it's, it's bedtime. Because if you leave the curtains open, it'll be daylight all the way through the night. You'll wake up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom or get a drink of water or something like that. And you'll be like, why is it daylight out? Um, so to see the Northern Lights, you need it to be dark. And so the best time to go anywhere really to look for Northern Lights is going to be through the winter months um, when it is the darkest for the longest, that gives you the best opportunity. So um, Iceland is not a great place to look for the Northern Lights in the summer months. Um, there's you know, the off chance if you have a trip that runs in September, um, it may get dark enough for you to see the northern lights then, but even so, it's probably not going to be till 11 uh, p.m. Uh, or so that uh, it gets dark enough to see them and you need the clear skies. So there's, you know, maybe late August, September, it, it could happen, but uh, July, it's, it's, the sun is there um, and it's, it's too bright. So if we were to talk about the best place to go and see northern lights um, in the wintertime, you know, 
Nat Hub does the, the Churchill Northern Lights trips. I run those trips as well. I think I've done close to 30 expeditions to Churchill to see the Northern Lights um, for, for a specific Northern Lights departure or Northern Lights photography departure. And on every single one of my trips, at least one of the four nights we're in Churchill, we've had the Aurora Borealis. So I have a 100% success rate when I'm going to Churchill on a Northern Lights expedition. That's pretty good over like from 2017 until uh, this year, most recently, 2023. Um, that's that's pretty good odds. So I would put like if I was to say, you know, anywhere in the world to put four nights of dedicated Aurora viewing, I would I would send you to Churchill because my odds have been so good there. Um, I have seen the Northern Lights in Iceland, but I did a trip in September. It was 11 days long. We had 10 nights on the road and the lights came out one night. Um, a lot of the time we were dealing with clouds and um, kind of that, that coastal moist kind of warm weather. Um, and we didn't, get, we didn't get the clear skies that a place like Churchill, Manitoba does in the winter time. Hmm. Good information. Okay, logistics, can we do laundry? Ah, laundry. So that is, uh, it is, it is best to come with um, kind of enough clothes or at least enough kind of uh, layers for the trip. Um, laundry throughout is very difficult because we're often staying in places for just one night. Um, and so a lot of the facilities or a lot of the places we go don't really offer that. Um, so if you need to do laundry, um, Potentially, there, there's uh, usually towel drying racks um, in the bathroom. That's one option. Um, I've never had to do laundry while while I'm on the expedition. I always just kind of keep enough stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so laundry is a hard one because we're moving so quickly, and because we sometimes we don't get to the hotel till right before dinner, and then we're leaving the next morning at uh, at, at like 8 a.m. So we have less than 12 hours, and so laundry is very difficult um, to do throughout the trip. Okay. Um, one more question that was repeated several times was about how best to tip the guides. Can you tip them in U.S. dollars or do you need local currency? Um, so for our the for the the natural habitat expedition leaders, um, U.S. dollars is great. Um, for the Icelandic guides, U.S. dollars is is also fine they can they can always take that exchange it but if you want to um, offer them icelandic currency um, just go by that kind of one us dollar is 136 uh, krona so you, you can look at the the conversion rate there to get the similar amount um, but for local guides our icelandic guides um, totally fine to tip in us dollars or icelandic krona for your expedition leader uh, us dollars is definitely preferred excellent um, that's the last question we have time for today. If we didn't get your question answered, please do reach out to the concierge team or your adventure specialist for those answers. Um, but I'll turn it back to you for closing comments. Well, thanks everybody. Um, this presentation has been a lot of fun for me because uh, it, putting it together is just like helped me get prepared for my Iceland trip too. Um, and I'm really excited to see you out there. I, I know we're going to have a fantastic time. Iceland is just ready for us to go and have some just just go exploring. So look forward to seeing you out there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eddie. Your passion and excitement is very contagious. Um, thank you for everybody who tuned in today. Please join us again next week for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone.